third Melastom seminar. Uh, today we have the pleasure to to have Marcelo with us. Um, Marcelo is one of the raising stars of Brazilian systematist, systematist and also evolutionary biologist. Uh, he has done uh, his undergraduate course here in Brazil and also his master degree and then uh, his PhD was in New, uh, New York Botanical Garden. And now he's a professor here in Brazil at the University of, uh, Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. And I'm sure we'll have a very amazing talk. And afterwards, uh, we can, you can put your questions in the chat window or just uh, say say a word and then we will unmute you to to make to to say your questions okay so marcelo once again thank you for uh, accepting this invitation and we are very happy to have you here all right thank you vinicius for the introduction and thank you also everyone from the organi organization of this this mellow seminars it has been great and it's a great pleasure for me to be here talking to you guys today. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about a little bit about the diversification and dispersal mode in the family. And this is pretty, and then I'll, uh, in the end of the talk, I'll, I'll, I'll touch a little bit the, the trait database that is a topic that Fernando uh, brought up like last seminar. So let's try to to discuss that, further discuss that. Uh, so pretty much what, what I'm going to talk today comes from this paper here that I did like in my last postdoc and the, the supervision of the Andrea Olmos uh, from Unicamp. And I had great collaboration to do this like from Thais Vasconcelos and Ricardo Cribo. Uh, so I already have given this talk to another audience. So I'm gonna skip the introduction where I try to say how cool melastomes are. But I, I'd like to, to, to call your attention for like two uh, interesting uh, features that we have in the family. They're, they're not exclusive of the family, but they are, are very strong in the family. So we have this pantropical family, Melastomatase, lots of species around the world. Um, in the new tropics, we have like most of the species richness uh, of the family. And the species richness has this, this distribution that gently call Andean Center, that despite this, the name of and then center, he described this as like groups that have uh, most species like in montane areas in the new tropical. And Melastomatis, is a, he cites Melastomatis as one example of this pattern. So one thing that we have in Melastomatis is this geographical integrity, which means that clades are usually restricted or nearly restricted uh, so of some geographical areas. Like here we have like 10 clades, 10 major clades that are tribes or it's going to be tribes that are endemic of the new tropics and then we have others endemic of other regions in the world. And if we zoom in in some clades like Myconi, we see the same pattern again, like we have clades endemic of Eastern Brazil, uh, Amazonian clades, Caribbean clades, and so on. If we zoom in a little bit more, uh, we still have this pattern is not as strong, but we still see if we, this is Le, uh, Leandra. So we have a couple of clades like in Campo Pastres, um, Southern Brazil, and so on. This is interesting from the, the perspective of microevolution because this means that like uh, we have several independent experiments from Mother Nature and we can use that in comparative methods. So this makes melastomes a really cool clade to, to study microevolution. 
The other thing is that we have a lot of asymmetries in the tree. And by that, I mean like symmetries in, in number of species uh, uh, along the clade. So here we have the, the tree that I'm going to, to present today. We have like 1,700 uh, nodes in the clade. If we, we just make a very simple exercise, like if we go to each of those nodes here and count how many species we have here and how many species we have here and do the same and do the same and do the same, we got this distribution here. So we have the very shallow nodes where you get like two sister species. So they have the, the same number of species, but as you go uh, up the tree here, you, you start to see a lot of symmetry. So we got points in the tree where you have like 300 more species in one side than in the other. So here are the, the clades where the top 10 nodes where we have this, this higher, this highest asymmetry. So one is like inside the, the melastomoide, like uh, excluding, uh, Olive and then we have several in Myconi, uh, Melastom Melastomati, and so on. So, um, I guess, like, uh, despite the, the strongest one is in the family level, I guess when we look at those, these three, I guess the, the biggest asymmetry, or at least for me, the biggest asymmetry that we see is like in Myconi. Right, so we have like this giant myconic clade, uh, 1900 species, and then the Eryukinimi sister here with six, six species or, or so. So then someone might start wondering why, why is, is this asymmetry in number of species, right? So it might, uh, this asymmetry might have a very simple explanation, might be sampling, might be that everybody went crazy sample here. And there are lots and lots of species here that we haven't sampled. Uh, but sometimes this is real, and it, it seems to be the case here, right? We, we have most of the community samples. So when we have this kind of asymmetry, uh, is usually, uh, it, this is, and this is not a sampling problem, this is usually because the net diversification of one clade is much higher than the other. And there's some classical explanations in the literature to, to, to try to understand why this happened. So I listed here a couple that, uh, Vamozzi, uh, uh, mentioned. So the classical ones that people usually look into is like habit, uh, genome duplications, uh, pollinators, uh, and dispersal. So, and this, these traits are usually uh, try uh, analyzed, like in the context of like key innovations or adaptive radiations and so on. So in this paper, we we look at into this particular one here, right? This person. So the idea behind why this person could like uh, increase net diversification uh, comes pretty much from like uh, the one that the person that really spell out like why would be that was given each and he said that this dispersal by um, biotic dispersal but like by birds or or animals um, would be restricted but eventually some long distance dispersal would uh, facilitate like a low patry or like Pedipatry or some other uh, geographical speciation. And this has been uh, looked into other groups, like we have here this Lago Marcino paper where she looked into that uh, with berries and capsules. And she found support for these, these guys here saying that uh, berries would be a key contributor to this asymmetry like berries would be a key innovation for that particular group. Uh, in Melastomatase, we have this early, really nice paper here where they dissected literally the, the fruit types in the family. So we already knew that 
the ancestor for the family would probably be abiotic, as they found here, and that biotic disper dispersal would probably have evolved like a few times. Even in this tree that is not big, we have like few independent origins of like biotic dis dispersal. So we, we knew that. Other thing that we knew uh, that was like observed in the literature, and not only melastomes, is that usually the uh, abiotic uh, dispersal mode is, is stronger like in open areas and the opposite, like biotic in enclosed areas. Um, so with all these in mind, we had, we, we, we decided to do this paper. And then we had like a descriptive objective that was just to see how was the evolution of this trait in the phylogeny. So this is one. And then we have two main hypotheses that we, we wanted to test. The, the first one is that if the taxa with biotic dispersal would have larger uh, distribution size. And the other one was if like biotic, biotic dispersal would be a key innovation in the family. If biotic, if every time that we see biotic dispersal evolving, we would have a change in, in that diversification in the family. So this is, was the, the main idea of the paper. And in order to do that, we had to compile um, a lot of data. So we had the trait data that was just the dispersal mode. So uh, we, we went to the taxonomic literature pretty much to get like the fruit type and then we, we merge several fruit types um, in these two functional uh, categories. So we have like everything that was flash, we call, oh, here is, is the opposite. So everything that was flash, we call biotic. And everything that was dry, we call abiotic. So, and then we had our matrix. The other thing that we had, was like uh, also here just the distribution and this is quite interesting because it's a really conserved trait across the the major clades so here we have like can i move this out here yeah okay so here we have like uh, most major clades that the they only have one type of dispersal but we have a few exceptions here where the two types are are found in the same clade um, the other data that we got was the distribution. So in order to do that, we went to GB and download all the melastome uh, points available there. <clears throat> and besides the points, we also derived distributions from the from niche modeling. So we, we modeled the, the distribution of all these the species and then applied some thresholds and got the distribution. And then with this kind of polygon here, we can uh, build uh, richness maps, uh, stacking them up, uh, and we can also get the distribution size, which was one of the things that we want to test in, in square kilometers or something. Uh, but dealing with GBIF is not uh, simple. I guess it's our only option, but yeah, we have to do a lot of stuff to, to use that, that kind of data. So we have uh, all these steps were like done in, in with scripts. So we had like a couple of filters for uh, coordinates, like uh, uh, errors in like the coordinates. So invalid coordinates, coordinates falling in the ocean, uh, inconsistent coordinates is that like the coordinate is falling in Brazil, but the label set was collecting Colombia or something. Uh, so we remove all this data. And then we have this misidentification filtering, which is the, the problematic. So this is pretty standard to, 
to figure what are the coordinates that are wrong. But the problem of using GBIP relies on figuring, figuring like what are the misidentified specimens, right? So ideally, uh, what should be done or in an ideal scenario would someone checking, someone that knows the group, looking look into the map and say, no, this point here uh, is really suspicious. I would need to see the specimen to check and, and things like that. But doing, doing that for like thousands of species is, is unfeasible. So, and there's really no protocol established to, to do that. There's a recent paper that they looked into uh, several possibilities and somehow group specific the best way to do. So I did, I, we did like this kind of, uh, we had the list with countries that don't have MELA, so we could filter that. Uh, we could filter species that are in the new tropics, in the paleotropics. We could filter outliers, but this is also not ideal. What would be ideal for the future is that if we had a database of confirmed occurrence, and if we, like, we, I had one for countries, right? But if we had, like, for every single species in the family saying, oh, this species is known from Brazil, these states, and so on, uh, that would be uh, awesome. So we could cross check those tables because if every time that we're going to do a work like this, we send out maps to all the taxonomists, they, they just won't do it because it's too much. So if we build a database saying this species is confirmed to be in this state or this echo region or in this something, we can cross check the points with that table and that would be great. Uh, the other thing that we had to compile was the phylogeny. So this is our final data set and it has 1600 uh, species. So that's roughly 34% of the species in the family. And we got 13 markers uh, for this species. Lots of missing data but uh, lots of species. So as for GB, gene bank, you, you also need to, to, to filter the data. So I, I just list here a couple of things that we did. So we download, start downloading all melastomes, and then we have those phylogeography studies where we, we took them out and you, you update the, GBIF and, and GeneBank, they are kind of updated with like some standard uh, taxonomic database, but we we are using the melastomatase.net data uh, website that is is better for melastomes. And then you have the sequence filtering, right? So start splitting the markers of, of all those thousands of sequences that we have in GeneBank. We can check consistency of identification of the metadata that they have, uh, merge or remove duplicates, and then we remove markers with less than 100 sequence. So then we end up with 13 markers. And then uh, we did this consistent check with previous phylogeny. So this worked. Uh, so I got this 1600 species. And then for each of those species, I, I assign the clade that that species was recovered previously. So, and this was done by those major clades, those tribes. So then we can check, we can, you can run gene trees analysis and check. And this is, is a good idea to do that because sometimes you get a Myconi falling in, in Mariani or, or stuff like that. So, um, there's some problems also in GeneBank that needs to be checked. So again, this was also done with a lot of scripts. So if I want to repeat that, and these scripts are all available online. So if you want to repeat that, 
and update this tree, which is already outdated, you, you can do that. So here's, here's our sampling I just wanted to show here. So this is from July 2018. So bars are the number of species in the major clades that we consider. And darker areas here is that our sampling. So by that time, we had those tiny tribes with like good sampling. And then we had some problem here. Astronia was the worst. I guess Microlis is going to uh, be improved soon. And some were already improved, like Bertoloni, Cambosidesi. So I think we have a nice sampling already, but hopefully we're going to uh, improve them. So getting into the results, so this is like the, the, the reconstruction of the trait. So we get here in red the abiotic and the biotic. So as it was found previously in that fruit reconstruction, we also got here like abiotic, like uh, as the ancestral. And then we have biotic dis dispersal uh, evolving a few times. Uh, and it's interesting that is pretty asymmetrical, um, the number of changes. So changes to abiotic to biotic is are highly favored. So we got 18 times more changes. And we we recovered three changes here, but but I think one is 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 solid, like one in, in the genus Melostoma, but the other might even be related to phylogenetic error estimation. So we might be the symmetry might might be even higher uh, in the, the changes. So the other thing that like Henner said and was quite interesting is that maybe the, the success of uh, melastomes was those early shifts to biotic dispersal uh, early in the, the evolution of the family, right? So we want to test that also. And to do that, we, we fit some models and there is a, a model called early birds that describes pretty much what what she was saying hypothesizing for the family and unfortunately it was thresholding but we did not get support for for the early birds model but it was like thresholding p value of uh, 0.06 or something um, so it's almost our early birth. So what we have here is the number of changes corrected uh, by uh, branch lengths. So if we just tabulate the number of changes across time, we're going to have ma many more changes towards the present just because there are many more branches towards the present. So if you correct for that, we get a scenario like this. So we still have changes throughout the history of the family. But as she said, um, most changes were early um, in the history of the family. Uh, and then people usually tie this up with the, the bird diversification. So this is a bird diversification graph here. And the, one of the papers said that uh, birds really exploded around 50 million years ago, and this more or less match the most of the changes that we have. So we just touched this topic here, like superficially in the paper, but this could be further investigated on a more formal way. Um, the other thing that Henner said is that usually abiotic species. Uh, would be more diverse or with species richness higher in open areas and the opposite for biotic. So we mapped the, the distribution of this trait. So here we have the biotic and the biotic. So we're going to focus in the new tropics that where is where our sampling is, is more robust. So when I look at this map, I, I, I see a, a very similar pattern despite the trade. So maybe a biotic has more species here in the, the Amazon, but 
I kind of see the gentry pa pattern in both both ways. So I think regardless of the 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 dispersal mode, they have this montane distribution uh, as predicted, and at least with our this sampling here. But we see the what Renner meant when we correct by the species richness. So when we we correct that for the number of species of each dispersal mode, we kind of see that pattern, especially here in the new tropics. So we have a bias towards like um, biotic dispersal in the Amazon, Andes, um, Atlantic forest. And then we have this huge bias here of abiotic in the Campus Superstitious of Brazil, in the middle of the Cerrado. So this is what she said, it was interesting. So then we got to the, our first hypothesis that if like the biotic species had like larger distribution size, and then we tested that with a phylogenetic uh, ANOVA, and we tested that, I, I think this can, I had this, this in mind, I think that like we have a lot of species in the, in the melastomes, like especially myconias, in the myconia, that like uh, have huge distributions, like if you think of myconia calvescens and Cardemia irta or stuff like that, they have like huge distributions. So I think like uh, my, people might have this impression that the biotic have like a larger distribution and some, some of them are really witty and invasive. But when we tabulate all this data, so here we have the reconstruction of the dispersal, and then in those bars here, we have the distribution size. So we can see that some clades have larger distributions, but some clades have, and most have like more restricted distributions, but we have larger and smaller distributions in, in both uh, dispersal mode, and when we put all the, this data together, we have a slightly uh, larger distribution in the biotic, but that's not significant, and it's not even close to be significant. So uh, we did not find support for for our first hypothesis. And if you think about, there's some uh, dry fruit species that have like large distributions. So then we got to the uh, diversification analysis. So here is like this BAM analysis, and the result is this tree here where it paints the, the clades uh, based on the, its net diversification, the speciation rate minus the extinction rate. So the warmer colors would be higher net diversification. Uh, and the cold colors uh, lower diversification. And then it also places, uh, indicates the places in the tree where we have a significant change in the net diversification. And those are the, the asterisks. So if we, we have lots of, of, of shifts here in the, in the, in the tree and if we go back to our first exercise of just tabulating the number of descendants, I think that was the spectrum. So we have 26, in this particular tree here, we have 26 uh, diversification shifts. And if we tabulate by those major biogeographical areas, we have that most of the shifts are in the new tropics, which is expected, like we have most species here. But this might change because our sampling is, is biased towards the, the new tropical taxon. But I think we, we still have many more in the new tropics, but probably many more here in the, the other regions. So then we can test our second hypothesis that are those shifts here, are, are, is net diversification higher, like tied with like biotic dispersal? So this is, is our hypothesis that water theft. 
So we use a, a, a different method that's going to try to estimate the, the diversification rates uh, tying with this, this, this trait. So uh, in this method here, it also uh, is because this, this is somehow a little controversial method. So early, it was first proposed in this BC and was somehow a, uh, a very simple model and had problems. There's a whole literature on this. I'm not going getting into this. But then the people proposed the second option here where you also look into if your trait is tied with higher diversification, but also try to account for, for things that you, you, you're not analyzing. So there's some these hidden states. And what it really does is like, uh, BC would like say, put the regime in the, the all the clades with uh, biotic and the others with abiotic and just estimate the rates. And this also, and the HIC allows inside the biotic the rates to, to vary. So, and when we do that, we see, that the net diversification is higher in the biotic uh, dispersed uh, clades. And this is mainly due not to higher speciation rates, which kind of similar, but to extinction rates. So it seems that the abiotic taxa uh, in the gemellastoma case, based on this analysis, they might have a higher extinction rate. But the thing is that when we test for the significance of this, uh, we don't get um, uh, uh, support for, for biotic as a, a key innovation. So other things that we have not considered might be driven this, this pattern. And then when you look at the BAM again, and then you just tabulate uh, all these ships here, where are they? And then you found that, well, there are lots of ships in diversification in the abiotic clades. Um, there are also ships in the biotic clades, and the, the name, uh, the number is the same. And also, you also have a bunch of ships within biotic clades. Like in Micron, you have a bunch of ships, and they're all biotic here, right? So it kind of makes sense, the, the previous analysis. I just listed here a couple of ships where they are found. So all this we read, we have one here. And he'll tell you there's somehow a ship here. Uh, Blackie, uh, Myconi is probably the highest ship, maybe in the Mutalis. And we have, then we have in the Abiotic. So this, I didn't touch the topic like of tree reconstruction here, but this might change. So I would see this as a preliminary result because since this data set is, is a little bit big, was like 1600 species, uh, we had to use a uh, penalized likelihood to estimate the ages here of the final tree. So penalized likelihood is not ideal so it has this, this smooth parameter that we try to estimate, but somehow sometimes it doesn't do a great, a great job. And this is a very important parameter in the penal light like estimation because depending on the value, it pushes the, the, all the, you have like one calibration point here, the other here. So this is gonna be there, those nodes. And then everything between is going to be either pushed towards the present or into the past. And this pushing and going back is exactly what BAM captures in, in, in the analysis. So I think when we do a, a, a calibration with a, a Bayesian method, we might have a, some changes here. And especially this is, as I started my talk saying, those asymmetries might be related to sampling. So we put sampling fractions here in this analysis, but uh, ideally, the better the sampling uh, results could change also. So uh, we did not find uh, 
support for the biotic being uh, a key innovation in the family. So uh, we discussed this maybe it was a past key innovation because of the early birds, and maybe the signal has been diluted over time because additions of other traits and so on. So the conclusion is that what we knew already, right, uh, is like a complex scenario in the diversification of the family. Most sheep are in the nootropics, but the thing is like all those 26 sheep, they are, they are located in very heterogeneous clades, like regarding distribution, morphology, and so on. So I'm afraid that uh, we're not going to find like a combination of traits that explains like um, all the sheets. We're going to have some really specific explanations for for each clade. And there's really no methodology to, pin, to pinpoint this at this time. So uh, what can we do for the future? I guess the next step would be like looking into multiple traits because uh, a single trait is not going to explain much. Uh, and then we can look at multiple traits from the morphology perspective, and this is easy to gather. But I think the bottleneck for us to really uh, explain this, these patterns that we see in the family are this kind of data here, because it's I can get like a trait for a uh, morphology trait for a species of Leandra in two minutes going to the herbarium, but like to get in the pollinators of that, it's going to take me like a little bit longer. And repro reproductive biology, apomixin, and so on, is also take a lot of time. And also, we also do not have a lot of data on, on genome evolution, even the, the very simple stuff like chromosome numbers and stuff like that. So these are the really bottlenecks that we should uh, try to improve. So this bring, brings me to the, the next topic, the multiple traits, what can we do about that? So I was really glad that Fernando brought this up last week. And so we start, we had one meeting already, and he, this is a really preliminary trait, um, candidates to be harvested from the literature. And I'm sure this is gonna change, but what I, I wanna uh, uh, talk today about is that, I think the idea is that some people are gonna get like one trait, like wood density or with adaptive system, but there are some traits here that uh, I think most of it can come from the taxonomic descriptions, right? So for these cases, like uh, we, so I was working with Ricardo Cribo and Juan Mauricio Posada on gathering those data uh, from like a long time already, especially with Ricardo since our PhD, I guess. And so we decided to join efforts with uh, Fernando uh, and try to get those taxonomic um, this those traits that we can extract from taxonomy, taxonomy descriptions and what we have been doing is what i think fabian suggested why don't we do data mining in the taxonomic uh, descriptions so we were doing that and i just want to show here for you guys here briefly what we are doing so maybe someone get uh, get interested in and can help us with that. So what we're doing, we're first thing, like we're getting the descriptions out of the PDFs in like text file. So then we can read these text files, this information uh, into R or some other language, some other program, and then use it. And then, I was doing like some simple code. It's not like anything fancy, like machine learning, nothing like that. And I think we can we can do with simple code. Uh, first, because uh, 
I don't know, machine learning. But if some we get some Google people to work on this, that would be great. But I, simple code might work because of the mechanical nature of taxonomic descriptions. So if you think of a description, you get like habit, indomen, uh, leaves, inflorescence, and so on. And they're usually um, separated by a, a period. And then if you ask, if you import a description and you ask to split the description by periods, you get those plant parts in your, in the data. And then if you, what you need to do is just figure where is the trait that you want. So if you do habit, oh, it's the first trait, you don't need to do anything, it's the first. And then you got that, that string describing the habit. Then you, you need to figure um, where is the size of the plant. And that's easy because it's a number. So you can extract that number. And then for the habit itself is a little bit more complicated, but we can still get. So here's an example of what that, what our script does so far. So it takes like a, a bunch of TXT with the descriptions. And then it does that. It tracks the string describing the, the, the habit in this example here. Could be anything. Uh, so here we got the, how was the description. Then we got this string. We need to figure what is the size, what is the descriptor. So the size is easy. We got here. Done. And then for the descriptor, is a little bit more complicated because people is going to use sufrutescence, uh, subshrug, it's going to be a lot of things. So we can, for starters, you can get all those strings together and tabulate the number of things, how, where are the common words on them to build a new classification and then fish back those and, and transform those things. So here is like just a word cloud of the habit descriptions of like more than a thousand descriptions, I think. Uh, so we got this and then we start to see how people, what kind of terms people use to, to, to describe the habit. And then you need to decide where your classification and how this is going to relate to those terms. So you just build a little matrix saying, Subshrub and blah 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 is going to be shrub or and so on. So that's what we have been doing. And it, it this is straight from the script. So it kind of does a is doing a good job so far, but we still need help. Like for we need help with two steps here. Uh, generating those txt files with a, a description and, and, and is a very simple module, citation, species name, description. You can have hundreds in the same file. And then we need also, we also need help checking this because oh, sometimes it didn't recover the number here. Maybe it's because there was no description of the size of the thing maybe didn't get it. Uh, and then for this particular one habit, uh, you see things like epiphytic and tree at the same time. And then you need to check that because it's very unlikely that the plant's going to be epiphytic in the tree at the same time. What happens is that the person say, oh, is epiphytic on a tree of 10 meters tall. And so we, those little details need to be manually checked. Um, so that's where, where we need help. So if you're thinking in contribute to Fernando's database and you're going to focus on a character on a trait that is extracted from taxonomy, uh, maybe we, we should join efforts instead of looking for little traits with, we dump all the descriptions in a folder, then we can take, uh, all the, the, the traits that we want 
or that are pro possible to extract from a taxonomic description. So let us know if you want to contribute with them. And also thinking about, Fernando has this set of traits, but maybe in the future we want to, to build a taxonomic database. We can build an interactive key. We can find synapomorphies. There's a lot of advantages of having data in the database, right? So, and there is another thing that I just want to take the opportunity to, to say here. Uh, I have written this R package that takes tables and transform them into descriptions. So now I'm writing on another stuff that's going to take those descriptions and turn into tables. So I think at some point, most people are going to realize that this whole procedure here doesn't make a lot of sense. So if we build a taxonomic database and then we have like a, a model, maybe people will start like including this as at least as a supplement in the, the taxonomic papers. And I think that would be great. Like if we just start now including whatever we got as a table as a supplement, we're going to skip this step here of changing this to this. But what would be really great is that, like, if you think about GBIF, uh, if each herbarium would send a table with some crazy columns there, GBIF would not work. They, it works because they have the Darwin core. So if in the future we can get to a consensus of a, a nice melastome core format, um, we could just auto feed the data, the database and and I think that would be great. So I think that's all I, I got for today. How long? 30 minutes, that's good. Uh, so I'd like to thank like, uh, that, that was part of my postdoc and that was paid by the Brazilian government. So thank you and thank you all for, for your attention. Thank you so much, Marcelo, for this amazing talk and also for the updates um about the database and uh now we are uh, during your talk we reach almost 50 people so it's a really success and now we are um ready for the questions so please use the the chat window or even you can just ask for the for the word That, that that was really amazing, uh, Marcelo. Thank you so, so much. Um, really, really enjoy it. I'm gonna go right ahead and ask a question: Is how do you really take um, extension? I mean, because what we see in these asymmetries today is what we see today. But how? I mean, I know that you know. BC and all that, they, they try to estimate um, um, extinction, but, but really, how, do you, how can you factor that in, in, in your analysis? It's something that is always in the back of my mind. <laughs> okay, it's really nice to, to start with a really easy question. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, so this, is, this is, a, is a huge problem, right? That's, Estimating, I think if you if you go to the literature, you're gonna find that this is the most controversial talk of like estimating extinction from the tree. And so I try not to make a big deal out of, out of the extinction estimate. So I try to focus on the net diversification that is the balance. So in theory, like what we got is the net diversification. So it estimates the extinction and the speciation but i really would not really focus in the extinction result because it's not easy it's is a parameter in the in the model that it has been estimated but all the simulations people do uh, shows that is usually poorly estimated the extinction so it's, it's a parameter in the model but it's usually not well estimated so 
I probably didn't answer the question. No, no. <laughs> Marcelo, there is another question here in our chat. Uh, Kayo is asking, um, I cannot pronounce uh, he or she surname. Ka but... Kale Rukolainen. Rukolainen. <laughs> Rukolainen. <laughs> And uh, she... Kale probably is going to correct me through there. <laughs> <laughs> she said, thanks for the great presentation. And she asks, uh, were the species distribution models uh, built on climatic variables only? And if so, there might be a significant bias to estimate Amazonia ranges way larger than they actually are. Amazonia is climatically relatively homogeneous over large areas that contain regional scale difference in soil fertility. So it might be that the ranges, the, the ranges in the biotic group are actually smaller than in the abiotic group. I don't know if you get it, but... Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, we were dealing with only climatic models. So, and... We, we're sure that those climatic models are, are really poor uh, approximation, especially for the places like the Amazon. So on top of all that uh, was said, like the, the, the soils and that, we have the problems of sampling the points, even like the, we have like uh, scattered points in the Amazon and even the number of points to build the model is is not great so i don't know if that might change the 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 biotic the that that graph that we have the box plot i'm not sure if it's going to change but it's we would need to get more data and run right but it, it certainly would change the distribution of the amazonian species yeah but I think there's an issue of scale as well, because yeah. you can think of a species like um, Myconia dodecandra and a species like Tibuchina longifolia. They have a fairly similar distribution in the map, but when you go to the places, Myconia dodecandra is in the forest and Tibuchina longifolia is on the roadside, uh, gaps, stuff. So even though they look similar, one is a forest species and one is an open area species, uh, mm. even, even though they might have the same niche. So, and, and unfortunately at the level we gather the data right now, we cannot you know, parse out uh, a roadside that is open and a forest that is only 50 yards away as forest. And, and this is something that we will need to at some point incorporate, I think. Yeah, and I, uh, we didn't include soil, but uh, I think it would be, it'd be a good idea to try to include soils uh, for those models. And also some other stuff like tree coverage and somehow, but yeah. Okay, if someone has an, another question, please Agnes. Um, first, congrats, Marcelo. This was great, and it's really cool to see someone attack the monster. Like <laughs> one thousand six hundred species. That's fantastic. Also, to get the um, the big picture, and you you sort of sound frustrated in the end that you don't get a clearer picture. And then you said that maybe maybe it's more that each clay sort of has a different story or it, like a separate combination of traits that. Um, explains why why it diversified more than another. Um, and I think this is super valuable as an insight to look uh, or to actually get the story that the, although the, spe the family is super specious, um, each clade may have undergone a different history. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm always thinking about, about altitude. And I think again, that this probably also plays into what you're seeing here because of course it is sort of incorporated in your in your niche models but maybe this is another factor that has influenced clades um, differently basically the biogeographic history of the group and I think that was not included in the analysis yet so I think I mean this is a long shot to do for that number of species but maybe that's going to put a bit more light on the story 
And aside from that, I totally agree with you that we need more natural history data, including soil data also. Yeah. But yeah, we need many more people working on melastomes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, totally. Like if we the the we did the trait right dispersal. I think the next step would do dispersal in montain, like in Sky Islands and 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 other traits, pollinators, apometrys, genome size. So, but I don't think currently there is uh, some really great methodology. So far, people are doing like this trait by trait analysis. So maybe in the future, and that's probably the near future, we're going to have methodology to, to really put everything together, right? But definitely, that's, I think that's going to be the only way. And the, and the, each clade having its particular sets of characters, that, that's a guess, and, and maybe, maybe it's going to be, yeah. Yeah, but only, only these big scale studies that you're doing now can show whether I mean, this creates new hypotheses, and this is really yeah. great. Because, um, yeah. I mean, now that we are and can try to find whether there are some traits that make up separate clades. And yeah. then um, I was wondering, what is the smallest resolution that you get uh, for these Latin American climate data sets? Chelsea is down to one kilometer. Yeah, it was or is it thirty okay. seconds. I think I used yeah. like some thirty seconds. Because I was thinking whether it could be. In, in the Alps, we've, we've sometimes uh, sort of downscaled them to go to lower resolutions um, yeah. with super complex algorithms. But I think if you try to do this worldwide, this will be really painful. Um, and of course, I mean, you're introducing further bias there. So it's probably not, yeah. not feasible if you're working at the worldwide pantropical <laughs> level. Yeah, so niche modeling is like every week we got some new stuff and people are like crazy about it. So that certainly is going to 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 be improved. The thing that I didn't mention is that uh, in the analysis of distribution, I had to actually remove a lot of taxa because we didn't have usable points for many species. So that's another bottleneck, like uh, species distribution. Despite like all the collecting that we've done, uh, there are lots of species, and it was really surprising to me that like we've got DNA of a species, we should have a recent collection with coordinates, right? But there are several that we, we, at least it's not in too big. Marcelo, there is a question here from Tiago Fernandez. And he likes to know how long it took for the data mining and cleaning. Uh, to run the scripts or, or I'm not sure if they call. That's what the question is. Yeah, maybe they run the script. Well, to run the script is quick. It's like pretty quick. Even with a thousand speeches, it's like almost instantaneous. Like because it's just scrapping text and doing this not nothing fancy, so it's quick. But the thing is that with that, for each trait, you're going to need a different script. So with some, some kind of machine learning, you could program the thing to, to do for everything, right? But in this approach that we're taking, for each trait, you, you need a different script. And you need to do those word clouds and see how it's going to fit, uh, what is the classification. And another thing that I don't think I, every single bit of information from a taxonomic description we're going to be able to use. So when, you, when we get to shapes of leaves, of anthers, of petals, everyone describes that like differently. If you ask the same person to describe, it's going to be a nightmare. And then you can imagine like hundreds of people describing shapes. So I don't, I would not use that, but sizes and other things probably can use. Julie Denslow asks or comments that it will be interesting to know where the invasive spe species fit into those patterns. Yeah, I deleted the invasive. So the analysis, like I, I asked, uh, I forgot to, to mention, but like uh, to do not have like those bias with Cladimia irita. So Cladimia irita and my clinical vessels, though I removed those from the the analysis and 
yeah, I, I, I never look into the invasive species, but uh, from this niche perspective would be, would be quite interesting. And I have no idea. And I hope some people look into that because now we have these tools that we can use. Marcelo, I have another question. Um, do you think that this the dispersal mod could be somehow correlated with other um, reproductive traits like flower size, colors, and you know if the apomitikis are generally more flesh yeah. have generally more fleshy fruits? Yeah, I guess the 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 an obvious question like we, when we got this trait database is not only to 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 link to look into the diversification and key innovation, but also to see those kind of correlations, right? Uh, I know that you you have this idea, right? The, the big flower, dry fruits, and stuff like that. And yeah. probably, and I think is the the case like an investment on in the flowers, lower in the fruit, and I think is waiting. This analysis is waiting to be to be read. Yeah, <laughs> and it's yeah. going to be nice. Yeah, yeah. I had I had this impression from the field, but I think so. It'd be nice to test. Yeah, it's because so, sometimes so, you you got some exceptions, right? Blacky or or things like that. So the, when looking into the whole family, we it would be nice to really get the data to see. But yeah, the impression that we, we could get. To, our impression here at Atlantic Forest in the Campus of Pestris is that, like Myconi, tiny flowers, Microlisi, Mariani. I, I don't know, to me there is, a, and, and, Mar and Ricardo Creeble actually, uh, and I talked about this probably 10 years ago, maybe more. To me, it seems that there is also like a negative correlation between anther complexity and dispersal. So um, the things, it, it, regardless of flower size, so things with uh, that have are more heteranthrous flowers um, that that they we have like uh, develop big pedo connectives or big appendages. Those tend to be um, uh, uh, those tend to be capsular, and then the berry ones tend to have the simpler anthers, regardless of size. So in that sense, uh, Blakey doesn't it still fits that pattern, but. Yeah. Um, but that's in the neotropics. I really don't know how this would apply outside of the Americas. Yeah. And this is just, you know, me being like, you know, gentry, just seeing a pattern and mouthing <laughs> it out not, with no proof whatsoever. <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay, I don't know if, you ha if we have more questions. So please feel free. Ah, uh, here, Constantine, is is there a connection between the high number of abiotic melastomatacea and the area the family originated since abiotic dispersion seems to be the ancestral trait? Good question. The problem is to pinpoint where is the area the family originated, right? So I think so far we have this idea of like new tropics or Western Gondwana, whoever, uh, but like, uh, it would be interesting to, and, and that's the, the whole story before, like trying to really tie up like the biogeography and the, and the trait stuff. But yeah, it would be great to pinpoint where the, the, the family was uh, originated. But I think that's a really hard question that I don't think we'll be able to do that. Uh, like say it was in an open area in new tropics. Uh, not sure if we're going to be able to do that. At least with current methodology. We actually we got the result, but how trustable is, is another thing. <laughs> okay, um, Fernando is is um, giving an inform to to us. He said that uh, the group are making progress and that they should be able to contact and invite the holy group early in the next year and that we have assembled a core group 
to to lead the database about melastomatasia. So this is a very nice inform. And yeah, I think that's it. If is it good? Is there more questions? Please feel free. And if you're not, uh, I, I guess Marcel will be very happy to answer your questions and you can make contact with him um, by email. And, and again, thank you for, for coming and stay tuned for the next Melastome seminars in December. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.